That was really beautiful, wasn't it? A wonderful thing to get to sing songs together. There was a, a meme, I, get, I don't know what we call this stuff. It was a tweet or a meme or a funny or something that two different people sent me last week. They texted to me and kind of make me smirk a little bit. And then I noticed on social media that the same, it was a tweet that a guy had done. I don't know the guy, but a little line that he'd put out that was kind of going around social media. And I think everybody was talking about and, and I thought to get started tonight, our focus will eventually be sort of a survey of the Apostle Paul's letters, a little bit different than a usual sermon. But I thought I would first kind of seeing how this hits you, this little post that I think people are getting a little bit of a, of a kick out of. And it's just this, this is what it reads. If Paul saw the church in America, we'd be getting a letter. Okay, so a couple things hit me. I don't know the guy. I think it's interesting. I thought it was funny. You know, in a way, it's like that laugh, cry, funny kind of thing. But I think when you read that, I, I read quite a few comments to see if everybody else understood it the way that I did. And we were all kind of on the same page. I think when you read this, when you see church in America, what this fellow who I don't know, what he's saying is, if Paul came to America today and saw the state of Christianity in our country. I, I mean, you think that's probably what he's getting at? If it saw just, if he saw just kind of like the, the nature of, of church across America, he would be very upset with us and he would write a letter to America and it would be tough. It would be direct and it would be full of indictment and, and correction. And I guess if Paul wrote that letter, I think that's probably true, don't you? I think that letter would have a lot of stuff in it about worldliness and the grand exodus from worship that we're seeing among so-called Christians. It would talk a lot about people in our nation and idolatry and accepting immorality and just this whole really hollow concept of faith that's taken over our world. I mean, I, I do think if Paul wrote a letter to America, it would be pretty, pretty tough stuff. And I guess we could just talk about it tonight. Like we could just get a little group going afterwards and go, what else do you think would be in that letter? Oh, let me tell you what else he'd be getting them for, you know, and we could just list all these terrible things going on in the name of Jesus. All of it. None of it would help us at all. None of it would bring anyone in the room into closer connection with holiness. And probably like we would leave ourselves completely out of it. We'd be sitting over here basically going, we're pretty good, but the nation is a mess. It wouldn't be very helpful to do that. We'd be asking the wrong question. The wrong question is, what would Paul write to all of America about the state of Christianity? We wouldn't get anything good out of that. What I think we can do is ask some better questions that are more like the letters that Paul wrote. There are four better, much, much better questions that I want to kind of lay out there for you tonight and for our eldership tonight that have to do with Paul's letter, because he, he didn't write them like this. Paul never wrote a letter to a country. He never wrote a letter to a continent. He didn't just write a generic letter for anyone, anywhere who reads it. He always sent these letters to specific places so that the recipients in that location could consider its meaning for them. And that's kind of what I want you to do tonight. So I'd ask you, please, to open your Bibles to the book of Galatians. Let's do a little bit of survey work. Paul wrote 13 New Testament letters. That's half, roughly, of all of your New Testament letters. Again, he never wrote one generically, and he didn't write one to a country or a nation or a continent. He wrote it with a lot more specificity. Now here are a list of the 10 different recipients of the 13 letters that Paul wrote. You say, why are there 10 recipients for 13 letters? Because he wrote two to the Corinthians, he wrote two to the Thessalonians, and he wrote two to Timothy. But ultimately in the end, when Paul addressed a letter, he addressed it to Galatia, Rome, Corinth, Ephesus, Colossae, Philippi, Thessalonica, a man named Timothy, a man named Titus, and a man named Philemon. So already, I want you to get a better concept of how these letters were written. They're not written to handle everyone's problems everywhere, to deal with every issue in every place that are far from us. They don't actually have anything to do with us. He wrote letters to specific groups so that they could deal with problems that were specific to them. And so when I think about Paul writing letters today, I'm not at all concerned with a letter he would write to America, because I don't think he'd write one to it. Where would you send it? Send it to D.C. or 
California or Missouri. I don't know. I'm not concerned with some letter to America. I'm concerned about what would be in letters that were more like these letters that are a lot closer to home for me and for others. So what we're going to do is take these 10 different recipients and I want to show you that they break naturally into four different letter categories. And for each of these four categories, I will present a question at the bottom of the screen with which I ask you to interact that I think is relevant to us. Now, you'll note that I've listed them all in exact New Testament order except for one. I took the book of Galatians and I moved it to the top because Galatia is the broadest recipient of all of the letters. Galatia was not a city. Galatia was a region and it involved five or 10, not 50 churches, not a thousand churches, not a 10,000 churches. It was a region that had maybe 10 churches in it. It had uh, Lystra, you might recognize some of these names, Iconium and Derby and Antioch, Pisidia, but it, it was a small region. In fact, and it's okay if you can't see all this, but the green section there is Galatia. He said, I'm going to send a letter, not for everybody everywhere, I'm going to send it to that particular region to deal with issues that were particular to you. Now, what I found interesting is I did a little, actually, okay, I got on my phone, like, used my thumb. I don't know. I was like, there's how big Galatia is. And then I sort of scrolled over. And it turns out that that's roughly the size of East Texas. Take Dallas to Shreveport, maybe up in the Texarkana area, down to maybe Lufkin. That region, which has not a whole bunch of churches in it, right? I mean, it's got some, but not a whole, whole bunch. That's about the size, the broadest scope of anything that he wrote. And so I got to thinking... Well, what did he write about? What would you write to an area about? Well, he wrote about things that were relevant. Are you ready? To that area. He didn't write about, hey, let me tell you what's going on over at Rome. We got to deal with this Rome problem. He wrote about things that were happening in the region of Galatia. He didn't write about the world's problems. Let's get all scared about things that are happening in some dark corner that we can't even find. He said, the churches in this area have some real issues on their hands. So I made a little list here and I think I'll just show you all five. I was in the book of Galatians and I was just kind of looking at the different things. And the first couple are very straightforward. I, I would expect this in any of his letters. He just says in Galatians 1, we'll walk through it together. In Galatians 1, he was talking about the gospel of the Lord Jesus in verse 7 and how you shouldn't distort that gospel. That what you need preached in your region is you need the pure word of God. Now, you might argue he'd write that to anywhere and he would write that to anywhere, but he wrote it to them. He said one thing is you're going to want to do that. The second thing you're going to want to do in this text is make sure that you're not just following the one gospel, but you have given your lives to Jesus. The letter for the regions of Galatia and all these churches is, look, you guys have some interesting problems going on and I want to talk about those problems. I think we should talk about what's going on in the regions of Galatia. But first, do you love the one true gospel, the word of God and Galatians 2.20, for instance? Are you like me, someone who says, I have been crucified and I just want to live for God? He said, I hope that's true because let's talk about your two problems. The region of Galatia, one of their largest problem was effectively traditionalism. It was those who were binding circumcision. They were binding the festivals. They were trying to, chapter 5, verse 1, they were trying to take those who Christ had freed and they were trying to put them under a yoke of slavery. It was sectarianism. It was traditionalism. It was not the teaching of Christ. And the interesting thing about Galatia is in that region, twisting of scripture wasn't liberalism. It was traditionalism. It was twisting it to choke people, not twisting it to open up their, that they could go in any direction. So he said, first of all, you need to look at one of the ditches. One of the ditches in your region is traditionalism has replaced the simple truth. On the other hand, number four, there's also the other ditch in the regions of Galatia. You know, there are some among you, chapter five, verse 13, there are some among you who are taking their freedom and being irresponsible with it. They're saying, oh, I'm not bound to any of that traditionalism stuff. And in the end, I'm free and I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter how it offends anybody else. And he deals with that. And then, he, of course, he kind of wraps it up by saying, look, whatever you guys do while you're handling traditionalism and worldliness, sectarianism and liberalism, both problems, 
Make sure you're pursuing this with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. So he dealt with specifics among them. So you know what's a better question? Here's a better question than us getting in the corner going, oh man, if Washington DC got a letter from Paul, he'd be ripping on them. If, how's that gonna help you and me? I got a better question. What do you think would be in a letter that Paul wrote to the churches of East Texas? Now, some of you might have felt a little ping inside of you, like your autonomy radar just went off. Like you can't write a letter to churches. Each church is its own church. He wrote a letter to churches. He wrote a letter to all of those 5, 10, 15 churches about things that were happening in their space, things that were causing division among their numbers. You know, it would be a great question, not just for our eldership to talk about, but for families to talk about. If Paul wrote a letter to East Texas, I know what he would say. He would say, you need to stick with the gospel. You need to crucify the flesh to live what is right. And you need to keep the fruit of the spirit. But also in East Texas, there is traditionalism. And there is also worldliness. There are people in our area who have twisted their faith to do a bunch of things they shouldn't be doing in our area. And there are people who have wrapped laws around laws and made requirements for faith that God didn't make. And you know what? Ours are not going to be the same as Oregon. I've got preachers up, friends up in Oregon. They're dealing with a lot of the same things. They're dealing with a lot of very, very different things. What's going on on the East Coast is not the same thing that's going on here. And so a really neat idea would be like, okay, the most broad stroke letter of all of his letters, by the way, we're, if in case you're doing the math, we're not doing these one at a time. So if you're going, this is going to take three hours. <laughs> Galatia stands alone. It is one of the categories of the one written to a collection of churches. I wonder if the elders of the local churches in our region, some of the churches in Mineola or Tyler, I wonder if they all just kind of got together and said, what's going on in our area? What is plaguing our people? I don't care what's going on somewhere else. What are the things that we need to start preaching the same things and talking about the same things? You think you could write a few things down? I think you and I would do a whole lot better figuring out how Satan is trying to affect East Texas than how mad God would be at someone in Minnesota you don't even know. These letters demand a more specific view, like regional things. So my family and I, uh, we had a few family members over last week, and my parents were there, and Hannah and Braden were there, and we talked a lot about uh, worship and tradition and clothing and all the, different, all the different things. And we talked about how in other parts of the country, they wouldn't even have these conversations. And I think that was a shock to one or two people in the room. Like, those aren't even issues. They're issues here. So let's talk about our issues. But let's understand that there's the truth and there's two ditches. And we've got to make sure we're not in either one. Now, in the other section, there's a much larger section right here. Rome, Corinth, Ephesus, Colossae, Philippi, and Thessalonica. These were actual local churches. Most of his letters were written to a local church about what was going on where? Church up the street? Thousand miles away? He wrote to local churches about what was happening at that local church. The Corinthian letter is a great example. The Corinthian letter, had, the Corinthian church had a lot of problems. I mean, they were suing each other. There was immorality being tolerated. There was a lot going on. And he didn't write a letter generically and hope they got the point. He wrote a letter to them about their situation. But I want you to see something important in 1 Corinthians 1. The, the tweet suggests that you know, if Paul wrote a letter to the churches of America, he would light them up. He would get them, condemn them. Well, you know, the Corinthian church was pretty rough. Uh, I can't get into the details tonight, but there's a pretty good chance most of the people in the room right here would not attend the church in Corinth. You would not. You'd pull out your label maker and just start slapping stuff across them. When Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthian brethren, he started that letter optimistically. He spoke of fellowship, even with that local church with its problems. He says, verse 3, chapter 1, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which has been given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in Him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Jesus was confirmed in you, so that you're not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, what's interesting about that is from way over here, a half a world away, we can look at the Corinthian church and say, I don't even think those people are going to heaven. Paul said, you are my brethren. And I'm not talking about you. And I'm not writing a letter to someone else so that they can talk to someone else about you. I'm coming right to you optimistically and spiritually. Let's talk about your problems. Now, in a survey, and I'll put all of these up as well, when you survey kind of the entire New Testament, I'm going to print this up in the back. I haven't printed it yet. But when you survey the entire New Testament letters, if you really read Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, a lot of us in the room read every year, a little more often than every year. These are the themes that jump out. In the local church, he writes to them and he says, look, Jesus has to be at the center of everything. Colossians 1.18, he's got to be first place or none of this can work. A local church cannot survive if the membership does not put Christ first. It's a pretty simple idea. He goes on to say unity is important. In 1 Corinthians 1, where you are right now, in a church that had more division and struggle than you probably ever seen in your whole life, his call in chapter 1 was for unity, verse 10. I don't want there to be divisions. I don't want everybody running in a different direction. I want you to face your local church sin right in front. I want you to look right at it. I want you to say, look, we got a guy who's got his father's wife. We got a Lord's Supper proceedings here that are all twisted. We have somebody suing someone else. I want you to face that sin directly in your... Stay out of other people's problems. Deal with your issues. I want you to face them directly. Ephesians 5 talks about he facing them directly. I want you to inflict local church discipline. He wasn't calling for the churches of Macedonia to discipline each other. He said, I'm writing to you, Corinth, about things that you need to work for and how you need to discipline one another and find unity one with the other because the goal is forgiveness, Second Corinthian letter, forgiveness of the man and renewal. I want you to grow, 1 Thessalonians. I want you to excel still more in your love, excel still more in your faith, become deeper and better servants, grow stronger, love more than ever. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the centerpiece of all of it. Thank you. No. He said no. All right. It's kind of an emphatic no, I felt like. Uh, So this raises an important question. You know, you want to have a long conversation with someone in the church whose focus is on the wrong thing. Ask them to judge or assess what some other church is doing. Ask them to root out all their problems. Tell them, tell us when they pass the point of hopelessness and we should just label them and move on. People love to talk about that stuff. But when Paul wrote the letters about the resurrection and the hope, he was specific. And so I thought about this question. Here's a good question. It's not what would Paul write to our nation as a whole. I want to know what the Lindale Church of Christ letter would look like, don't you? Paul wrote a letter to the church at 211 West Hubbard, Lindale, Texas. I'll tell you this. We're imperfect people. There would be things that needed to be dealt with. There would be things that needed to be talked about. There would be probably sin in our midst that he had heard about that he would want us to address. But I'll tell you this, it would be optimistic. It would be hopeful. It would call for unity. It would ask us to rally ourselves around the resurrection of Jesus, not our own pet interests. And it would demand that we seek to grow in strength and love, Philippians 1, in unity and service of one another. No matter what was going on in this church, he would deal with this church and he would say, wherever you are, I want you to come in this direction and I want you to do it together. What do you think would be in that letter? I made a list of, I did not make a list of things, but I want you to think about that. What would he say about this church? What are we doing well? You know, sometimes you have to make people make that list first. What are we doing well? What would he say is exactly First Thessalonian letter? You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. All I want you to do is take that and do more of it. First Thessalonians. What would be our first Corinthians section? Where would he say, you know, this is something where you've lost focus or, or there's someone who's immoral among your midst or, or there's something that you need to deal with. He would want us to deal with it directly. A better question is what's going on with our church? Now, you may be a member of our church going like, I don't know. 
I don't know what he would write about. It's time for you to get more plugged in in this church. We need people who are invested in this local church, what we're trying to do together. Because if Paul wrote a letter, he'd write it and it would have our name on it. Let me give you a third category. They weren't all to groups. We had a collection of churches and then local churches. And then he writes two letters to Timothy and one to Titus. And these men were preachers. So you guys get to take a five minute break because this one's all about me and a couple others here. But he said, look, I'm not just going to write to the church at Ephesus. Timothy was working in Ephesus. So Paul wrote a letter to Ephesus. He said, hey, Ephesians church, Here's what you guys need to get focused on because you've got a first love issue we need to deal with and you need to get back focused on Christ and being the bride of Christ. But he also wrote a letter to just the preacher who was there. Open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I've thought about this many, many times. In fact, ongoingly, I have thought about this idea. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, we get some indications of what Paul would write to preachers. I'm just going to give you this brief list here. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, some of the things that he writes start very early in verse 3. He said, I urged you upon my departure, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. The goal of our instruction as preachers and teachers is love from a pure heart, and a good conscience and a sincere faith. He said a lot of men have strayed from those things. They teach things that don't matter. They teach things that can't be proven. They teach things that raise more doubts than offer conclusions. Men teach things that don't make the church stronger. There's some preaching that has gone on this year that I have heard that is all about somebody who lives a thousand miles away. That's about issues that have nothing to do with the local church that they are, that they're at categorizing things to fight some battle that has nothing to do with the local church where they are becoming stronger in the work that God wants us to do. One of the things I've worked on as a preacher is realizing that, wow, that thing's recording back there and somebody in Minnesota may be listening. That is not why I'm standing here tonight. I'm standing here to challenge this local work, to think about what we're supposed to be doing. He said, I want you to further the dispensation, verse four, the administration of God. I want you to teach people that their consciences matter and the way that they love each other matters. I'm talking about verse five. And I want you to talk to them about a sincere faith and what it looks like. I want you to tell them that Christ can save everyone, that Christ can save everyone anyone. I'm talking about 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 12 through 17. Paul said he saved me. It is a trustworthy statement, verse 15, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. He said, preacher, wherever you're preaching, preach hope to people. Preach restoration to people. Preach that God can save anyone, including you. Preach godliness in all forms of life and preach to the members how to live that life. First Timothy chapter two, verses one and two, talks about praying, being thankful for everything and praying on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Teach the people how to be godly. Teach them how to live dignified. There's some instruction about elders. Maybe I could have worded that differently, instructing elders. But the preacher is teaching in a way, 2 Timothy 2, that develops these men into becoming elders. A preacher's purpose is to come into a local church and teach people to be teachers so that that church can be self-sufficient because of its teachers. So that we can raise up men who are elders who can teach and who can serve instead of the preacher having to be at the head of all of the things. Instruct these men. And then uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, I put flee, follow, fight, focus. In case you guys didn't know, that's like, a, that's like an early 20s sermon every preacher has in his pocket. Like it's, we learned that really early on with like online outlines. But one of the things that you're always preaching is, look, verse 11, preacher, listen, focus, man. It's important. Teach the people to flee from things. And you, preacher, also flee from things like the love of money and evil. Teach them to pursue things, to pursue being righteous and godly and faithful. Teach them to pursue love and to be persevering and gentle. Teach them how to fight. Teach them how to fight the good fight of faith and stand up for it. And teach them how to 
Take hold, verse 12, to focus. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and you were made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I've gone through really weird times in my preaching where I don't even know some of it was even about you guys. Some of it was about me and some acts I was grinding or somebody I wanted to hear who doesn't even live here or some scar tissue I have from a place that's not even like this place. It's not even in the same region of this place. I lost focus on what the work is. And so I think about this a lot. Paul writes a letter and it comes in the mail and I'm thinking, oh, the elders going to get it. But it doesn't say to the elders of the Lindell Church. It's written to me. What's Paul's letter to me going to say? Chris, preach the truth for the church where you work. Leave the issues aside that you can't prove. Don't raise suspicion about people in a way that doesn't serve the will of God and only causes more suspicion and more backbiting and more problems. Be a unifier and someone who works together. Those are good questions. What does our region need to talk about? What does the Lindell Church need to work on? And what about me? And if you feel like you've been left off the hook, you've not been left off the hook because Philemon is you. Yes, you. Not you, the regional Christian, though God wants to talk to you as a regional Christian. Not you as a member of the Lindell Church, though God wants to talk to you about this church. Not you as the guy listening to the preaching, but you as an individual child of God. Open your Bibles to the book of Philemon. Of all the letters that Paul wrote, the last four, First and Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon, were written to individuals. But Philemon was not a preacher, it doesn't look like. He was just a, just a Christian, like everybody else. I mean, Titus and Timothy were too, but it wasn't written about preaching. And what I find really interesting about this last one, do you guys know the story of the book of Philemon? That Philemon is a Christian who lives in this certain area. Philemon's a good guy, and he had a slave. And that slave, Onesimus, had fled from him, did him wrong. It looks like he did Philemon wrong. Anybody ever done you wrong? You like that? That's what happened. Did him wrong and fled. Not a Christian, runs. He ends up over in Rome somewhere in a Roman prison and he meets a guy named Paul. And the Apostle Paul converts this guy. He changes this guy's thinking. And in verse 10, I appeal to you for my child, my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. And Paul said, OK, here's the deal, Philemon. I know you're mad. I know you feel done wrong and you've even got some legal rights to torch this guy when he gets back, but I'm sending him back anyway. And here's what it's about. In this letter, it's about grace. Verse three, grace to you, Philemon, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about your wonderful faith and love. Philemon, I hear about it. You're a good man. I hear about your love. I hear about your faith, which you've had towards Jesus, the Lord Jesus. I hear about the way you serve all the saints. Honestly, you're just one of the best guys I've ever met. But now I'm going to appeal to your humility because everybody's the best guy you've ever met until somebody does them wrong. Do you know this? Everybody's great until somebody crosses you. Somebody sins against you. Somebody deserts you. And then sometimes we flip. And things get really messy. And then there's this, all kinds of things that cross up. He said, I'm going to appeal, verses 7 and 8, I'm going to appeal to your humility. I'm going to appeal to your heart because I'm going to ask you to receive this brother back. In fact, he's going to become a part of the local church where you are. I'm going to ask you to receive him, verse 17. He said earlier, he said, I could command you to do it. I'm an apostle. I could say, you're taking him back. He's your brother now. He said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to appeal to your faith and your willingness to be humble. And so in verse 17, he said, if then you regard me as a partner, Paul used a little bit of the equity of their friendship or the, uh, the, the belief they had in each other. If you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. And then he talks about refreshing hearts with love. Verse 20, yes, brother, let me benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. So just know that based on something Paul did one time, if you happen to get a letter in the mail from the Apostle Paul and it's not addressed to churches or this church or what your preacher needs to do differently, it's got your name on it. Chances are it's going to ask you what you've done with that damaged relationship. It's going to ask you how you have behaved after someone has done you wrong how you have accepted and restored and forgiven. You know, the stuff that the preacher's supposed to be preaching about? 
You know, the stuff that the elders are supposed to be showing us that churches are supposed to be standing for. It gets personal when it's not a church name on it. It's your name on it saying I'm writing to you now. I'm writing to you about the way that you love and forgive and help. So what I want to do tonight, really, it's kind of a survey. It's just, hey, let me tell you about these letters because they're not written generically and all over the world. And, and the truth be told, I mean, this is funny to think about. Although I have this sneaking suspicion he might actually be a little bit more optimistic than we would be. I'm a naive, I think I'm an optimist. Most people who know me say I'm just naive, okay? But I think there may be some hope in our world. But the point is this, this is not what's going to happen. It's not whatever did happen. And if he wrote a letter today, it wouldn't be what would be there. You know what it would be? It would be the fact that God sees us, that God sees you, this region of believers, this local church, this preacher, and each person in this room. Now, here's something really cool. It'll change the way you read the New Testament. Because while these letters were written to Corinth and Philemon and Thessalonica, they were ultimately preserved for everyone else to read. And they was even told that they should pass it around to Laodicea. And there was even a Laodicean letter that we don't know about that was being passed on to Ephesus. But at least do me a favor this week. When you're reading the word, please read it like personal mail. Read it like he's writing to something specific to you, to your family, to this church. And don't think about how, ooh, this can fix everyone else's problems because he never wrote a letter to fix anybody else's problems. Do you understand what I'm saying? Paul never wrote a letter to fix somebody else's problems. He always wrote a letter so that the reader, so that the reader can hear the truth that pertains to him and can learn to grow. That reader is you and me. I'm thankful for the New Testament, the narrative nature of it. But let's stay specific. Let's pray for our country. But let's understand that God has not just spoken generically to people who speak English. God has spoken to you. And this is how he has done it. And we need to be listening. Hey, if you're ready to listen, if you realize that this isn't uh, for everybody else, this one's for you. And there's something about the Bible that you need to be called to. It's personal to the Lord. He's calling you because he wants to see you respond. If you'd like to do that, you can do so now as we stand and sing.